Hello, my smart and talented friends, and welcome to the Global Science Network. In the past two videos, I showed how to build artificial synapses and artificial neurons. I was going to have the next video in the series be about how to build hardware-based neural networks. However, I decided it is best to first make an attempt to explain the fundamentals of neural networks from first principles. This means providing simple examples while also showing the actual numbers the entire way through the process. Lots of videos about neural networks show the equations or a very broad, high-level explanation of an example. However, this only leads to a superficial understanding of neural networks. In order to build hardware-based neural networks that will change the world, we are going to need to understand the fundamentals. Neural networks are awesome, and it is already crazy to think of a day before we had resources such as ChatGPT, Claude, or Google Gemini. What is even crazier is that these awesome neural networks, which are simulated on a digital computer, are actually quite terrible from a computational viewpoint. In a very short amount of time, if we properly build hardware-based neural networks, today's systems that cost billions of dollars could shrink to the size, cost, and power requirements of a cell phone, while also being a thousand times more powerful and capable of being conscious. That is what makes working on these projects so exciting. It is literally the future of life. The classic artificial neural network is a simulated neural network. This means that while you might visualize the neural network as a physical structure with inputs, synapses with different weights, and neurons that sum these together to create an output, the reality is the network is a computer program that is performing math, which is processed on a digital computer. As you watch this video, think about how these networks are similar to how the brain works and how they are different. I will have an upcoming video discussing this in detail. Let's start with a single neuron, which is also called a perceptron. Here we have inputs x1 and x2, as well as a bias input x0, which is set to 1. Each input is connected to the neuron with a weight, which will get adjusted during the learning process. These weights are similar to biological synapses, where each synapse has a different strength, resulting in a different amount of charge transferred to the neuron. This summation, which can also be called the weighted sum or linear combination, is denoted with the letter Z. The weighted sum is calculated by multiplying each input by its corresponding weight, summing these products together, and then adding a bias term. In this case, the summation is W1 times X1 plus W2 times X2 plus the bias term times 1, which is just the bias term. The result of the weighted sum is then sent to an activation function. A step activation function is a basic activation function where if the summation is below some value, the output will be off or zero. If the summation is above some value, the weight will be on or 1. This is similar to the output of biological neurons, where the action potential being sent out of the cell body is an all or nothing, on or off event. It is up to the synapse to then determine how much charge and what type of charge is transferred. In an artificial neural network, the weights serve a similar function and determine the strength of connection between neurons. There are three other commonly used activation functions, which are the ReLU, sigmoid, and TANH. The sigmoid function is similar to the step function, where if the summation value is very low, the output will be zero, and if it is high, the output will be one. However, there is a graded response when the summation is near zero. The output of the sigmoid function is scaled to values between zero and one, so now the output is set within a predictable and stable range. The tanh function looks similar to the sigmoid function, but the output values are set between negative one and one, rather than zero and one. The ReLU activation function is widely used today in advanced neural networks. When the weighted sum is negative, the output is zero, similar to the step function. The difference is, ReLU allows for a graded proportional response when the weighted input is positive, meaning the output can exceed one and is directly proportional to the input. Now an actual neuron does not send a graded response. It is either on or off. However, a neuron does change its firing rate. So the ReLU activation function would be more analogous to the firing rate of that neuron increasing rather than just saying, yes, it fired. This dynamic representation more closely matches how neurons operate, as it is the firing rate that ultimately controls the output. Activation functions are important because they add in a nonlinear component to what would otherwise be a linear combination. Even with an activation function, though, a single perceptron can only classify datasets that are linearly separable by a line, plane, or hyperplane. To create a curve or complex decision boundary, we will need a multi-layered network which we will discuss later in this video. For this first example, we have 100 data points that are plotted on a x1, x2 coordinate plane. This is basically the xy coordinate plane we all know from grade school, but we are calling x, x1, and y, x2. A single perceptron can learn a linear decision boundary that can separate two classes. 
The two classes in this case were made by saying if x1 plus x2 is greater than 0, then it is class 1. If x1 plus x2 is less than 0, then it is class 0. We can see that the data is linearly separable, but how do we train the perceptron so that the decision boundary properly separates the two classes? For a single layer perceptron to learn, we do not need to use backpropagation. The learning method is called the perceptron learning algorithm, or perceptron learning rule, or just the delta rule. Here are the steps that allow for a perceptron to learn. Step 1. Randomly set the weights and bias. Step 2. For each set of training input values, a forward pass is performed to get a predicted output, which is denoted as y hat. A forward pass is when the perceptron computes the weighted sum of inputs and passes it through the activation function to get a predicted output. Let's look at this table that shows the values and calculations for one epoch. In one epoch, a forward pass is performed on all 100 data points and the weights and bias are updated based on how the predicted value compares to the actual value. Here we have inputs x1 and x2, which are an ordered pair that represent one point on the graph. In step one, we set these random weights and their bias. In step two, the forward pass first calculates the weighted sum z. It then passes that value into the activation function to get the predicted output y hat, which will be zero or one. Step three is to calculate the error. The error equals the actual output minus the predicted output. If the actual output is one and the prediction is one, the error will be zero. If the output is one and the prediction is zero, the error is one. For the last case, when the actual output is zero and the prediction is one, the error will be negative one. Step four is to update the weights and bias. The equation to update the weight is the new weight equals the old weight plus the learning rate times the error times the input. Let's look at an example. In the first training set, the error is zero, so the weights and bias stay the same. In the second training set, the error is one. The updated weight W1 is calculated by adding the current value of W1, which is 0 0.50 plus the product of the next terms. So we multiply the learning rate value of 0.1 times the error of one times the input x1, which is 0.98. This makes the new x1 value 0.60. The updated weight w2 is calculated by adding the current weight value of negative 0.50 plus the product of the next terms. So we multiply the learning rate of 0.1 times the error of one times the input x2, which is 2.24. This makes the new x1 value negative 0.28. The sign of the error will determine which way the weight is adjusted. If the error is positive, there was an under prediction and the weights are increased in the direction of the input vector. If the error is negative, there was an over prediction and the weights are decreased in the direction of the input vector. The amount the weights get adjusted depends on the learning rate and the size of the input. The bias is updated in a similar way, but without multiplying by the input. You can think of the bias as always having an input of one. Bias new equals bias old plus the learning rate times the error. In this case, the old bias was 0.1, the learning rate is 0.1, and the error is 1, so the new bias is 0.2. When working with neural networks, it is common to think of the weights and inputs as vectors. The dot product can be calculated with the summation equation without the bias term or the dot product equation. With vectors, it is probably best to think about this in terms of the dot product equation. Here we have the input vector dot the weight vector equals the magnitude of the input vector times the magnitude of the weight vector times the cosine of theta. Now in the first example, the angle between the input vector and initial weight vector was 111.4 degrees. One way to think about this is that the projection of the weight vector onto the input vector is the distance here, which is negative 0.26, which gets multiplied by the input vector to get the value of negative 0.63. Now when we take the cosine of 111.4, it is a second quadrant angle, so we know the cosine will result in a negative number. This negative value is fed into the step activation function, so we know the prediction is going to be class zero, without even multiplying the vectors. The point in this case is class one. So there is an error and the weights need to be updated. This will be done in the direction of the error vector and the amount will be based on the learning rate and input value. Now let's look at how the new weights adjust the boundary layer. The decision boundary layer is a linear equation that is based on the weighted sum equation. If we solve for x2, we have the equation in slope intercept form, y equals mx plus b. In this case, x2 is y, the slope is negative weight 1 divided by weight 2, and the x2 intercept is negative b divided by weight 2. So when we plug in the input 
weights, and bias value, we get the linear equations for the initial and updated decision boundaries. We can see that the input point is initially on the wrong side of the decision boundary and would be considered class zero. The updated decision boundary is rotated counterclockwise and now properly classifies the point as class one. Looking at the plot, these points are classified correctly and these points are classified incorrectly. For the next error point, you can see a very similar change. Error point three is a bit different as it is a class zero point that is on the wrong side of the decision boundary. This makes it so the error correction vector is opposite of the input vector. The updated values allowed the boundary to move in the right direction, but notice in this case it did not move enough to now be classified properly. We continue this process for all the points which have an error and make adjustments to the first 12 errors that were present in epoch zero. An epoch is a complete pass through all 100 training example inputs. Step five is to update the weights in bias for a complete pass of all 100 training example inputs. Then repeat this process until there is convergence. In epoch zero, there were 12 error points. Epoch one had six errors, epoch two had six, and epoch three had five. In epoch four had zero errors. At this point, we can say the solution converged and the weights and biases are now finalized. This was an ideal case, so the error went to zero, and normally convergence would be set to some reasonable value. Convergence means that our perceptron has found weights in a bias that work well, and further training doesn't improve the performance very much. If the model never converges, the program can stop after a set number of epochs. We can plot the average error and accuracy versus epoch to see if the training is working. For the step activation function at four epochs, the training error goes to zero, which makes the accuracy 100%. It is a good idea to plot the data with the decision boundary to ensure the two classes were properly separated. Plotting the average error versus epoch for different learning rates makes it clear which learning rate allows for the fastest convergence. Looking at the architecture diagram, we went from initial weights and bias that were randomly chosen to now having finalized weights and a bias for the model. With this final perceptron architecture, we can now feed in any values for x1 and x2, and it should be able to accurately predict the output class. Since the model is now trained, the operation is really the same as a computer program performing the summation math and passing it through the activation function, which is also a mathematical operation. It seems quite clear that this math could be efficiently performed with a custom chip that does this math with basic logic gates or an analog chip that could continuously update the output as the inputs change in real time, which would be quite powerful. If we added an X3 input, we would now be working in a three-dimensional space, but the perceptron operation would be very similar. The difference is there is now one more input term and one more weight to adjust. This allows a single perceptron to separate three-dimensional data by a plane rather than just a line. Here we have the initial values for the perceptron, the final values, and we can see that the perceptron is now able to properly classify all of the points. Now the problem with single layer perceptrons is that they can only solve or classify linear problems where there is data that can be separated by a line, plane, or hyperplane. An easy way to see this limitation is by looking at basic logic gates. I showed how to build logic gates using individual transistors in a previous video. Let's look at the AND logic gate as the first example case. If input A is on and input B is on, then the output is on, which is class one. In the other three cases, the outputs are off, which is class zero. The class zero and class one can be separated with a linear decision boundary, and this logic gate could be made with a single perceptron. The OR, NAND, and NOR gates are also linearly separable. However, the XOR and XNOR gates are not linearly separable, as both classes will be on the same side of the line, no matter where the line is placed. Many people say in the early days of neural network research, Marvin Minsky pointed out that the perceptron could not classify an XOR case and Frank Rosenblatt could not counter this limitation and this crushed the excitement and enthusiasm for neural networks for many years. I don't know if this is true, but if it is the case, it is really sad. It seems obvious that the brain can classify complex tasks and that this limitation can be overcome with multi-layer networks. So now let's look at how to build a simple multi-layer network that will solve the XOR case. To watch the next video, click here.